Hi, Kristen Atchison, and we are talking about neuroimaging. This is the fourth video for chapter one. So let's talk about some different brain imaging techniques. Um, the first of which is EEG. And EEG is measuring electric activity in the brain. So when the neurons are communicating with each other, they're releasing, um, again, that neuroelectrical, that neurochemical information, and there are small amounts of electricity that are released. This is something we can measure. Um, and how we do it is this woman in this picture here is wearing an EEG cap, um, and those little um, dots on the cap are the electrodes that are measuring um, the electrical output from her brain. And the EEG results are the image on the left of her picture. Um, so they look like that. We get the, the, ray, um, the waves of electrical activity. The other thing we look at with EEGs are ERPs, which are event-related potentials. And that measures this neuronal activity, again, through the electrodes. So most of the time when you're getting, um, when we're using EEG data, um, what we're actually using is this ERP. And the image of what an ERP looks looks like um, is the image on the right of her picture. And so again, we're measuring, and this is again giving us information about the electric activity. Now with all these kinds of brain imaging techniques and brain um, uh, the information that we can get from imaging, we have um, pros and cons. So the pros for this is we get really great information about time. We get really great temporal, temporal information. Um, so almost real time, um, we can see how quickly processing is happening, um, and which is very, very important information. How quickly somebody is sensing something, how quickly they're making um decisions about perception. The problem is, is we're getting really bad spatial information. So where this is happening in the brain. Because that electrode is on the outside of the skull, um, it's kind of does a straight line um, kind of into the brain. It can measure electricity kind of straight through there um, and kind of the surrounding active areas. So we don't get really great spatial information at all. We'll get general ideas of where this activity is happening, um, but we're not getting great spatial information here. Another method is NEARS. And NEARS is using actually lasers um, to measure the blood flow in the brain. Um, and so what you'll have here is you see there's these two little nodes on this image. The one with the arrow in is kind of a laser firing in and the, um, the detector is the one with the arrow pointing out and that detects kind of how much light is coming back out. And what it's doing is again measuring brain um, function through blood flow because the more that area is active, the more blood will be active in that part of the brain. And we get, again, are getting really good temporal information. But as you can see, our spatial information, not so much. We have, again, general ideas of where this activity is occurring, um, but we're not getting really great data. Other techniques, we have um, PET scans. Um, this PET scans are measuring metabolic activity using radiation. Um, again, we're not getting um, super great spatial information. It's better than EEG, um, but it's again, not giving us very good information. You can see here, we're getting kind of general areas where there's activity. Um, we're getting a general map of where the activity is happening. Um, but again, it's not going to be as specific as some other things. Cons, we're not getting great temporal information. This can take a while. Um, and what's really bad is it's invasive. Um, so to use the radiation, you have to actually ingest the radiation. Um, and it's low levels, um, but because most people don't want to have that radiation and um, introduced into their system, um, getting participants to agree to it can also um, be less likely. So it's a lot more invasive than, than the, these other techniques that we've discussed. Our final technique um, is kind of the gold standard to some extent um, for certain questions in brain imaging because it gives us the best pictures. Um, so when you see these beautiful brain pictures like we have here, um, and they can even show you parts of the brain inside um, where activity is happening, that's coming out of MRI and specifically fMRI. So they're using the same technique. The difference is fMRI is the functional um, use of it. So we're doing this while active. An MRI is going to do something kind of more of a static picture. Um, it's not going to give you kind of any information about, 
like ongoing um, where the fMRI is giving us information about activity. And the pros is we have really great spatial information. Again, we're going to get really, really pretty pictures with this. Um, the cons is we've got really bad temporal information. Um, again, be um, because this is taking longer, we're not going to get the same kind of information about timing um, as um, we are with the EEG, where we're getting almost, we can see how long this is happening, but we're getting the great spatial pictures. The other problem with this is you have to be very, very still in an fMRI machine. Um, and so it really makes it hard to use um, with different age groups. So if you, um, it makes it almost impossible to use um, with babies and small children um, because they aren't very still um, and they don't understand that they need to be still. Um, so fMRI is something we don't typically see as much use with children. We'll see a lot more use of those EEGs and those um, NEARs because it's basically just a cat you wear. Um, so it's very, there's not a lot of, it's not very invasive. Um, it's not as hard um, on the child. Um, and so we can get better information about that. Next, we're going to watch a video. Um, the video talks about three different tasks and brain activity involved with those. Those tasks are kind of tangentially related to this class, um, but mostly I'm showing this video because I want you to see the tasks and I want you to see them discuss the tasks and how those tasks work. The first task is going to be with an EEG cap, um, and the second and third tasks are going to be with fMRIs. The video's narration sometimes makes sense. A baby penguin swings on that door. The baby And sometimes it doesn't. The truck goes up and down in the papers over hills. The electrodes are recording Another where penguin. and when my brain reacts to these mistakes. The when the mistake is simply a word that doesn't make sense. Pinga turns up the penguin really loud. Pinga An area in the back of my brain, mostly on the left, reacts within two tenths of a second. But when the mistake is grammatical, the concert are starting. My brain pounces on the error within one tenth of a second, and this time in a region toward the front and exclusively on the left. Following me into the video booth and equipped with a much more fetching hat is six year old Danica. Wood into that black stove. When there's a mistake of meaning, Pinga claps her ball happily. Her brain, just like mine, reacts in two tenths of a second. But when the video says something grammatically incorrect, the pancake falls onto there his head. Ingu her brain is slower to respond than mine. Face. And the response isn't so focused over that area in the front left. In fact, Helen Neville argues, it takes perhaps 10 or 15 years for the brain to organize itself to process grammar swiftly and efficiently in just one focused, specialized region. Looks, for example, like that's an important area for sequencing different kinds of information, and of course sequencing is an important part of language. Looks like areas just behind there are very important for tool use, in the mm. left side as tool well. Tool use. Tool use, yeah. Tool so, use over, over where language is taking place. Actually, it's possible that one aspect of language is closely tied to tool use, especially this kind of um, action planning and sequencing mm. that we have to do in order to talk. To find out how closely language and tool use are linked in my brain, it's time for me to go back into the MRI machine. I'm at the University of Oregon again, where a research team is trying to find out why humans are so naturally adept at using tools. You doing all right so far? Yeah. Very good. So I'm going to give you the gripper in your right hand now. The plan is for me to use a tool, or actually to imagine I'm using a tool, to perform a task I'd learned just a couple of hours before. Okay, Alan, now the fun begins. We're going to scan your brain while you're making judgments about how to grasp those objects with your hand or with that new tool that you learned how to use earlier. And we're going to be looking to see where those patterns of activity are. 
Because my upper body is not supposed to move in the scanner, I'm pressing foot pedals to signal which side of the knob I would grasp with my real thumb or the gripper thumb. And even though in each case my arm and hand would actually move very differently, the areas of my brain that light up are the same. While using the tool, my brain treats it as an extension of my body, and it's actively planning the muscle movements that manipulating the tool requires. All this tool use planning is going on in the left side of my brain and very close to the areas we use for language. The fact that they're so close together to speech production and, and, uh, and so much of the planning up over here, mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that significant, do you think? It, I mean, it, it could would, reflect the fact that there are some, some common underlying processes. So for uh -huh. example, a candidate I would suggest at least worth considering is this ability to adjust a behavior that's happening right now in anticipation of a goal we want to achieve in the future. For example, if you were to say the word tulip versus the word uh, ticket, watch what your lips do when you say tulip. You start tulip. to anticipatorily round your lips in, yeah. during the T in anticipation of the vowel coming uh -huh. behind it. Yeah. Watch what you do when you say the same uh, consonant, T, in the word ticket. Tulip, ticket. Tulip, ticket. I'm starting to make way for the OO in tulip, when, with, when, even as I'm saying the T. But in ticket, I don't do it. I, I, I'm, I'm already here with tulip, but I'm, yeah, I see. You do something a little bit different. So, so that's a clue that there's some kind of planning going You're on. You're planning ahead. And in language. And, and when chimps say tulip, they don't do that? <laughs> they, as far as we know. <laughs>when people are thinking about other people's thoughts. And and wait, this is like over here? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So sitting just above my right ear is a patch on the surface of my brain that allows me to see into other people's minds, or at least wonder about what they're thinking. Is it any kind of thoughts, or is it just me trying to think about the thoughts of another person? It's just when you're thinking about somebody else's thoughts. Ah, amazing, huh? So that ends our video on neuroimaging. Thanks.